Today is our great pleasure to have uh, uh, Fabio Capitano speaking with us. So Fabio got his uh, PhD at HEH and then spent his uh, uh, research career until now at the National University of Australia. So Fabio has really broad interest um, in geophysics, uh, including the Earth dynamics from the ses seismicity to climate interactions from the mountain building to global plate motions. And I just read from his introduction uh, uh, from his webpage that with a variety of machine learning, uh, with a variety of modeling methodologies, high performance computing, and literally obligation to deep learning. And uh, the, uh, the talk that Fabio is going to share with us is about the thermochemical lithosphere differentiation and origin of a cryotonic mantle. And uh, in our audience, we do have uh, geophysics and geochemics that are interested in this topic. So we hope that we could leave another uh, 15 minutes for our interaction with our participants after your talk. So with that, I'll give the rest of the time to Fabio. Thank you very much, shang Zhu, for the, for the invitation. Um, it's my pleasure to be here, ideally. I'm not, but uh, that's uh, the situation at the moment. Um, first of all, I'd like to disclose that I'm not 100% well today. I might sneeze, but don't worry, it's not COVID, so there's no need to, to leave the room. Uh, the weather is a bit uncertain these days and eventually I got a cold. Anyway, so today, let me see if I can rearrange my windows this way. Yep. So today I'm going to talk to you about uh, um, the results of, uh, of a work that I've uh, published lately and perhaps also an extension to some other work that is ongoing. Um, and my focus is on the differentiation of the thermochemical lithosphere and the application that it has for the tectonics and evolution of the early Earth. Today we're going to start talking about the origin of the cratonic mantle. So cratons in general, they might be not the most scenic place on Earth, indeed. Uh, this is an image of the Pilbara, uh, which is quite bare and quite uh, flat. Uh, nevertheless, they provide some relevant information about uh, the past uh, so yes, essentially they record the processes that were active in uh, the geological past. This is just a map taken from the work of Sinti, Sinti Lee, and shows a little bit uh, the distribution of these uh, blocks in continents that they can go back down to the uh, Archean times, so more than 2.5 giga years ago, and uh, reveal some, uh, provide some information about uh, the processes that were active there. Uh, there are some information that obviously are not direct, are indirect, and some are evidences that come from the xenolith, uh, which are these uh, inclusions in the lithosphere that come from the deep. And uh, from the analysis that's been done and published in 2014, uh, we did know already somehow that um, these um, xenoliths, they provide information of uh, equilibration deeper in the continental lithospheric mantle here. But of course, uh, the new, uh, the novelty or the new important things is where they formed originally. So apparently they formed at very shallow depth initially, and then eventually they equilibrate a deeper depth. The second evidence comes from the remnants of the, of the crust, in particular of basaltic crust. So uh, by recovering um, the degree of melting and uh, some thermopetrological uh, uh, modeling, we can essentially conclude that uh, crust, this type of crust was segregated from the continental atmospheric mantle, uh, reaching very high melting degrees, which are up to 0 0.4, 0 0.45, 0 0.50, depending, and um, imply uh, or allow us to reconstruct the temperature of the, uh, of the mantle, uh, the potential temperature of the mantle, excuse me, back in time, uh, they tell us that the original mantle, uh, so uh, before two giga, giga years ago, uh, the temperature, the average temperature of the mantle was essentially uh, hotter. So the question is uh, how cratons do form in what was a very different uh, regime, in a different Earth. The Earth was hotter and now craton form was not clear. So what I've done here, I've essentially put in this slide all the uh, a proposed environment for the formation of the continental lithospheric mantle or subcontinental lithospheric mantle as whatever, whatever you want to call it and the crust in those times. So these mechanisms are uh, summarized here. The number one is proposed by uh, Graham Person is the formation in a ridge-like environment. Uh, a second environment has been proposed, it's the island arc, in which essentially the crust that has been formed before, basaltic crust, can be flushed in the mantle, differentiate and create uh, different type of signatures, like TTG, for instance. 
Another uh, mechanism that has been proposed is essentially the interaction of the plumes with the pre-existing little sphere for the working of the crust. And then there's another other environment that has been proposed that I've called uh, the um, stabilization uh, processes. Uh, the stabilization processes include uh, number four, which is the subduction and the stacking of these very different uh, pieces of the lithosphere, continental lithospheric mantle to form stacks. Uh, and uh, then the number five would be the eventual thermal equilibration and the maturation of this continental lithospheric mantle. Uh, all this environment put together, they obviously call for a simple uh, uh, question, is this plate tectonics? Uh, it looks like plate tectonics, there are subductions, ridges, um, arc magmatism, um, so it all really looks like plate tectonics, but the question is, uh, was there any tectonics in the early Earth? It's a complex question, uh, requires, has been debated long, um, and there's a short answer. The short answer is, in principle, no. So there was no plate tectonics in the early Earth, but there is a longer answer that is essentially we can uh, glean from this uh, plot here of the zircons that you can see. So you can see that if we go back in time, we have had some cycles of formation of uh, um, sediments, uh, granitoids, and other type of sediments recorded by the zircons. But before three, upon giga years, everything looks a bit different. So we have the same type of cycle somehow, but they plateau a different a minor amount, in, indicating that in principle, some, cro some processes, these processes here were still active. So these are processes that uh, lead to crustal formation, uh, but nevertheless did not operate like today. And in particular, whatever has been formed here must have been also recycled because if the, those mechanisms they are similar to present day and they produce as much as crust they would produce today so why this has not been preserved so conclusion is that longer answer is that uh, add similar features crust formation is one but you know operate like today and likely uh, production and mostly destruction was important so uh, what is this now? Uh, the logic behind it is if it has a duck's bill, there therefore is a duck. And it's a logic that not all the time works because as you can see in this picture, this is classical animal, uh, Australian animal, a platypus, it has a duck's bill, but definitely not a duck. So that's the logic behind our thinking or most of the reasoning that, that we've been following. So once we define the tectonic regime for the formation of these cradles and many others, then eventually we can define better the context for the key processes. So if we call all this regime plate tectonics, then eventually uh, we'll be uh, scaling down to processes like the subduction, ridges formation, cradle formation. But of course, this is a logic that doesn't really, it's circular in a way, and doesn't really work well. So to me, what I've done essentially tried to do the opposite. So starting from K processes up to what would be a tectonic regime, and therefore addressing directly uh, detailed key processes and see how they collate or they, they uh, work together, operate together in, the, in a larger scale tectonic regime. Key processes are definitely the melt extraction, the hydration, and the rheological weakening. And these are processes that from the primitive mantle, they allow to, by different partial uh, differentiations, allow us to form what is the crust. So a little crust on top of the subcontinental lithospheric mantle. And this is in a plot uh, proposed by Nick Arndt and some other co-workers. Uh, there is another key process that it's uh, implicit in this um, sketch is that essentially there is another part of the primitive mantle that uh, it's depleted, uh, is dehydrated and becomes rheologically stiffer. So which is essentially this part here through the Harzburgite and back into the mantle or otherwise back uh, to form a subcontinental lithospheric mantle. And these processes obviously are relevant for this portion here. The way we in, embed this type of processes in our uh, thinking is essentially the following. So we can have a, a different uh, geotherm that intersect the solidus here. Uh, they might have different height above the solidus and therefore they might reach different uh, melting degrees. Uh, and this load that I use also, uh, I'll show in a second, I also use the equation of state that allows for the density. And this in principle, it's a concept that we can find applied at the ridge model proposed by Nick Arndt in his work here. Excuse me. Uh, where essentially we go closer to a ridge or something that looks like a thin in the lithosphere here. And we can have a melt extraction with the formation of the crust. And at the same time, we will have progressive melting 
and uh, the embedding eventually of this uh, melt depleted residue in the lithosphere here. Uh, this is simply embedded in uh, my numerical models, of which I'm going to talk about uh, later on. And uh, it seems like an obvious uh, process here. So we have the formation of the region, this simplified model here, with some melting, and the flow is such that this melting eventually comes, follow this path, and enters the lithosphere. And these are the details of the numerical code that I use. And eventually we can embed this process here, uh, oh sorry, this process here, so the proposed ridge model, into the numerical models. Um, this uh, melt depletion, another uh, process that is important is that um, my focus uh, is on the, the melt depletion and the stiffening. So it's an important process, as I said before, for the subcontinental lithospheric mantle, but it's probably has been overlooked a little bit. It's been proposed by Korenaga in many works, and it works like that. So have you seen this one? So we have a, a rise of the geotherm above the solidus, increasing depletion at three different levels here. And then what happens there that we can have a uh, rheology that is dependent on the temperature, and there would be the thin lines here. But if we consider there would be a stiffening due to a factor F, which is nothing else, F would be the depletion degree, then eventually it, it really results evident that the profile of the, excuse me, the profile of the rheological profile of the lithosphere it, uh, is different. So we have some blocks, they undergo stiffening. A second observation is that. Uh, with um, thinning, so with this geothermal, uh, geothermal rise above the, sea, uh, the solidus in a way that is similar to uh, the ridges, if you want, or continental rifts, what happens is that the depletion increases, and with increasing depletion, of course, increases also the integrated stiffness of the lithosphere. So you can see that the, the, the blue curve here, which corresponds to a very thin lithosphere, it's rheologically much more stiffer than the red profile, which corresponds to a thermally thicker uh, lithosphere. So it's kind of counterintuitive, um, counter, um, so it goes the opposite way. Uh, another key process that, uh, of the early Earth is essentially modeling uh, convection, convection in principle uh, of the early Earth, which has different properties. The Rayleigh number was high, the internal heating has to be high, present day uh, it's around 0 0.7, 0 0.3, and uh, back uh, in the Archean, at the end, we would, could have gone up to four times present day, if not higher. Uh, some basal temperature were uh, higher. Uh, we can run the model with the viscoplastic low for one giga years. And another three parameter we're going to talk about later is the uh, yield stress of the lithosphere. So what happens in this model, they start convection, and this starts essentially is taken as T0, is taken up for 18, right? and I zoomed in into an area. So what happens there, we have two downwellings here, and in the center of the downwelling, uh, the lithosphere is essentially undergoing stretching. So this stretching creates a rifting in the surface, and the blue curve on the top is um, the strain rate uh, here, the horizontal strain rate, is it written somewhere? Yes, here. Um, and then eventually we have cooling, and with cooling we have the increase of the uh, heat flow here, the red curve. So what happens after 50 million years, uh, excuse me, what, after, 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 what happens after 50 million years, uh, more or less, is that the uh, stretching has finally migrated lighter, laterally, as you can see here, uh, because this block in the center that is a uh, contour with the white contour, it's undergoing depletion and therefore stiffening. So the stiffening prevents rifting, and the only way that stretching can take uh, on is moving laterally, as you see in the sh shaded area. And then eventually what happens is that the rift migrates and will create new conditions for uh, renewed rifting, which is laterally propagating. If so, this process, if you can see in the whole model that here covers more or less uh, 200 million years, you can see that there is a stretch initial st stretching, then there is melt extraction. Melt extraction leads to stiffening, which is this area contouring white. The stiffening leads to cooling, as you can see from the decrease of the red curve of the heat flux. Uh, cooling uh, and stiffening uh, leads to thickening, and thickening leads to stretch migration, so the, with the migration on the side, and then eventually stretching takes over somewhere else. And this is a process that lasts more or less 50 years. So every 50 years, you can see there is a new uh, center is undergoing stretching. So what happens is that this is a, a negative feedback that promotes uh, long-lived migrative drifting, uh, allows to emplace 
uh, large amounts of depleted continental lithospheric mantle um, over very broad areas, we're talking about 1,000 kilometers there, uh, stabilizes the uh, continental lithospheric mantle by stiffening, cooling, and thickening, and opposes the rift to ridge transition. So uh, in this uh, model, we can form a continental lithospheric mantle in a, con in a tectonic environment there is a, a characteristic rift, but it's not a ridge. So uh, stretching undergoes just like in ridging, but before a ridge is formed, the rift uh, ceases. So if we fast forward and we see at the very end, we can see two snapshots. One would be uh, 620 and the other one would be the 1000, which is more or less 600 million years from the original time taken to be this one on the top. So it's a process that lasts around 600 million years. And it's a stabilization process that shows that, first of all, the lithosphere has been cooling and thickening because of this progressive embedding formation and embedding of stiff bodies here. You can see that this lithosphere is rather thick with the isotherm indicating that uh, these blocks are now embedded in the uh, cool lithosphere. And then somewhere, sometimes, or locally, uh, some of these blocks, they grow beyond stability and uh, they form some downwelling that you can see here with some stacking. So these blocks, they were originally this one, a 620, at a thousand, so around 400 million years later, they've been produced some more here. But at the same time, the original blocks like this one, they've been deformed and stacked into um, a structure, a thicker uh, lithospheric structure. When we compare these blocks and uh, the signature they have in PT to the condition found uh, recovered from the Archean and Proterozoic Cratons uh, uh, xenoliths, uh, I put together two uh, data sets, the V, uh, Sintili and the co-workers, and Irina Artemievas, in 2006, and I plotted here a number of, of um, cratons. Uh, some are Archeans, some are not, uh, but all of them, they show that they have, they really plot on this part of the total. In gray would be the total range of uh, uh, geotherms that I found in the model, in my numerical model, and the colored block with Roman numerals are essentially the blocks that really underwent um, stiffening, uh, melting, melting depletion, and stiffening. So, so the real subcontinental lithospheric mantle. So if we see, they plot on the same trend, uh, proposing a viable mechanism for the stabilization. And also we can see that some of these, they reach deeper than 200 kilometers where possibly they are found in, uh, they match the geometry that we find in this stacked unit. So, uh, talking about uh, tectonic environment, the question would be now having a look at the melt degrees and volumes. I'm sorry, there is some spelling here, it's melt degrees and volume. And how does uh, uh, this vary? Well, uh, we've seen that we might change in a convective mantle the, the geotherm and the potential temperature might increase in this gray, sorry, in this green, uh, but this wouldn't essentially increase the amount of uh, the volumes of melting, not even the degree of melting. And it's evident from this red curve here that if we really want to uh, produce much more uh, melting, uh, intense melting and volumes, we need essentially to raise the geotherm above the solidus. The best way to do it is to thin the lithosphere and like it happens at rifts or at ridges, and the best way to thin a lithosphere is essentially by yielding. Therefore, it turns out that for the rheological loads that we've implemented, uh, classical plasticity here, Byerly type or, or drucker prager in this case, uh, the cohesion, so the, the integrated strength of this lithosphere, or the total strength, however you, you want to model it, that would be a free parameter of relevance. And I'll show you what I mean. So imagine that you have a lower strength, this lower strength is going to increase the rifting, therefore the thinning of the lithosphere, and this one eventually is going to increase the depletion and the degrees volumes. I have three uh, models here. They are the same models. The only difference, they last a, gig a giga year, a uh, billion year, uh, in the numerical model run, but the only difference is that uh, initial conditions are the same. The only difference is the yield stress, or in particular the cohesion, decreases. So it's very high on the top and it's very low at the bottom. All these values here, they are more or less like present day. So present day will be 50 to 10 
50 in the lab, observation will tell us there is probably around 10 megapascals, if not lower. We don't really know, it's a free parameter. So what happens is if the yield stress is really large, uh, you can see that there is a, a number of these uh, depleted and the depletion degrees indicated from pink to blue. Uh, most of these blocks are uh, pinkish, some are blue, but most of these are pinkish. If we decrease the yield stress, uh, we can see that major uh, um, yielding occurs, so some areas develop some pinkish to blue uh, melting. So these blocks, they undergo melting degree that raise up to 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. If the yield stress is really low, then you can see that most of these blocks, although the, the geometry are very similar, uh, but they are larger amounts, so they are pervasive, and also the degree of melting, they are quite higher, and we also reach 0.4 and above. How do, do this model compare to the observations? Well, the observations are in these colored blocks um, uh, from Herzberg, and this dashed line will be for Komatiite, which I haven't included. But you can see that this model, the most, all of them, they fall in the right uh, ballpark, and we have melting degree on the horizontal, and the potential temperature has been inferred uh, for the observation and for the model in vertical. So the yield strength, as you can see, really plays a role in varying how much of the, uh, the volume, of course, which is not represented here, but the degree. So the lower is the yield stress, the higher is the melt degree uh, reached. And this is a critical parameter because if you can see all these other models that had um, different yield stresses, they don't develop different potential temperature. So the potential temperature uh, can't really tell us much about the, the rigidity or the plasticity of the lithosphere. Another important aspect, again, is when we look into the degrees we've just did and the volumes, is that if we take the area integrated in the whole model at the end of the simulation in the area that you see highlighted in the red box, and we can plot it as a cumulative, uh, uh, occurrence, then we can produce some plots that look like these ones. These plots, the, they might be uh, familiar to some of you, and they're not different from the one that had been uh, produced by Graham Person in his group, or also by uh, Bill Griffin. And uh, this very one, it's a uh, um, recap of all the work that Bill Griffin has done um, and his group uh, in the paper that lately came out by Taras Geria, Bill, um, Pershuk, and some other workers, in which essentially they show that uh, the distribution in percentage of uh, depleted peridotites. These depleted peridotites are very similar to, are conceptually the same that I've been uh, showing you produced in my models. And when we stack them all together, we can see we can reproduce this shape that is very similar to the shape inferred for these many cratons here. Um, so uh, indicating some characteristics of environment that are similar, but also the distribution, the amount of the depleted, so this depleted will be above 0.3, we can reproduce only the same quantity, only if the yield stress is relatively lower than what is constrained by the laboratory, but still into the uh, range of what uh, present day would be. Uh, another important aspect that follows from the yielding is that yielding allows some uh, uh, lower uh, strength, allows some yielding. And even models that reproduce this uh, lower uh, strength and uh, a snapshot of the evolution that you see here that covers uh, 60 million years, uh, more or less, you can see many uh, features that are the features that are classically uh, reported for Kraton formation. I'll just give an example, this one from the Capval and uh, from the work of Simon and, and co-workers. So what they reported, they reported major shallow melting uh, over a very long time and uh, uh, if you can see here this classical uh, sketch it's very similar to the environment that are reproduced in the models so essentially they come that emerges in the models so rifting uh, pro um, propagating rifting that propagates laterally but eventually you can see here and creates a large amounts of depleted continental lithospheric mantle that eventually is embedded in the crust another features that this uh, author highlight is um, an episodic subduction, which I've highlighted in orange, uh, 
and uh, where the pre-existing crust is uh, taken into subduction, melt, and reworked into the upper plate. And you can see here that this is a classical subduction-like environment in which the, the, the magenta, which is the crust, is essentially taken into subduction, can uh, melt, flush into the um, arc, and then eventually resurface. But you can see that eventually uh, doesn't really last long. And the last feature that we can we can observe is essentially this uh, progressive reworking uh, that in principle is environments minor reworking. There are uh, processes that are uh, uh, possible here where we have the rift in propagation. Then once the rift propagates and jumps here is essentially rifting where an original crust was already formed. So this is an environment not for the formation of a juvenile crust, but for the reworking of pre-existing crusts, as you can see from the model. More in general, if you have a look at the long, um, at the long uh, term evolution, we have these features that are episodic plate-like plate motions here, as you can see that they, they vanish. Um, and because they are episodic and these uh, plate margins like they vanish after a short time, uh, these features they remain as fossil uh, tectonic features inside embedded into the uh, stabilized lithosphere. And so we can see that in this stiff, uh, cold, stabilized lithosphere, we can see traces of rifting, but we can also see traces of episodic subduction quite clearly. These are, uh, more in general, features that are reported, as I say, from many um, cratons, and this is another example for the uh, Pilbara, uh, where I always like to come back to, because he's here in Australia. And this is the work of Martin van Kranendam and some other co-workers, in which they reported between 3.8 and 2.8, a number of rifting events and uh, episodic subduction um, and remelting and reworking of the crust. These are all environments that are very similar to uh, those that I showed you in, in my models. So we end up with the first conclusion, which is uh, long-term rifting uh, during perhaps the Aedean and uh, episodic um, subduction-like or plate margins-like uh, features were active, but then eventually uh, the uh, cooling of the, um, the, sorry, the progressive migration led to the embedding of blocks of depleted lithospheric mantle inside the lithosphere and the progressive migration until eventually the whole lithosphere became too stiff to be uh, to allow for plate tectonics like features. Another aspect of the second effect of yield strength, which is important to highlight, is what happens in the mantle. So these are the same models I showed you before, and you can see that the crust, which is in, uh, in this deep uh, magenta now, I've strengthened the color so it's more visible. You can see that when the, the amount of crust that is from the surface might not vary that much, but the amount in the mantle varies a lot. So in this, at the end of the giga year, this model with high yield strength doesn't have much in the mantle, it's mostly white. But then the, the amount of crust recycling in the mantle, so this magenta here, increases with decreases yield strength to a point uh, in which also the lithosphere is heavily recycled in the mantle. So these two processes, they compete together and eventually uh, characterize the evolution of uh, of the crust and the subcontinental lithospheric mountain in these models. That's how they go. So top, you see the crustal production. So if we decrease the yield strength, so it decreases in this direction from the black to the red, you can see that with decreasing yield strength, we can produce more and more um, um, uh, melt integrated in the mantle, which is scaled for uh, the full uh, length of the model to produce some realistic crustal thick. <coughs> <laughs> oh, excuse me. Some realistic crustal thicknesses. But at the same time, if we measure not only the melt production, but how much of the melt rate is produced, we can see that it's mostly coming in this part, but then most of that is also recycled, as I showed you before. So recycled in this direction, in this direction is thickening by cooling and magmatic addition. So we have a period of 500 million years for all these models, independent, independent of the uh, yield strength that we choose, as long as this is above um, 
20 megapascals or below 20 megapascals, sorry. So we can reproduce a, a, a time of more or less 500 million years in which we have a lot of cross production, a lot of recycling, and then eventually uh, the lithosphere is finally stabilized, stabilized as I showed you in the sketch before. Uh, this one, sorry, this one. Uh, so uh, this also leads us to conclusion number two, and then and eventually we, we might have had these processes at the, in the Hadean, the early 500 million years of the, of the Earth, in which crust could have been produced, but also had to be heavily recycled. Then eventually this recycling was opposed by increasing the amount of stiff uh, lithospheric mantle produced, and eventually the lithosphere stabilized. All of that, of course, is way before plate tectonics. So, might be enough to explain this first billion year here. Of course, we were talking about plate tectonics or the tectonic regime. The question is still valid. So we've seen at the key processes, can we have an, an idea on what's the name of this animal? Was it plate tectonics or not? Well, the tectonic regimes of the Earth, uh, the way we do understand that, it's uh, mostly uh, modeled on the idea that I showed you before. So this is the work of uh, Craig O'Neill, uh, in which he showed that if you increase the internal heating and you model the strength of the lithosphere, you can mostly capture all the uh, behavior of a planet like the Earth. So we have a stagnant lead that looks like this one. We have an episodic in which it just you have a complete overturn of the lithosphere. And then otherwise you have some mobile lead tectonics, which is a proxy for plate tectonics in which stable converging uh, and diverging margins are formed like subduction and uh, divergence with some motions that it really, like, really looks like, look like uh, plate motions, so rigid plate motions. Uh, how this model compare, uh, this, this idea compares with my model? Well, uh, tectonic regime of the Earth versus model at low uh, internal heating, what happens that with time, the average temperature and the potential temperature, they decrease slowly. It's a consequence of the uh, convective regime, the vigor. And if you plot the mobility, which is the vertical surface uh, RMS, uh, sorry, the horizontal RMS velocity over the total VRMS, in a classical way, like it's done by Paul Tagli and some other co-workers, we can essentially reproduce the same uh, regimes. So we have a sluggish uh, episodic lead in these two ranges here for these two uh, high uh, yield strength. But then when the yield strength decreases, we finally have some uh, mobile lead and episodic. So we can reproduce essentially these trends here. The melt here is negligible. However, when we increase the uh, internal heat, the melt becomes substantial. And because it is a, um, a rheology, what happens there that the stiffening, what happens there that we start with some regimes that are very similar to the one we've seen before. So with, decre with decreasing yield stress in this direction, we can allow from a stagnant to a mobile lead, but the problem, so we can reproduce this first 500 million years, the problem is that these are not stable. So the dehydration, the dehydration stiffening kicks in to reduce the mobility of this stage. And therefore, all these regimes, all of them, they all um, evolve into a second uh, regime, which is definitely not so mobile anymore. So if we put them together in a plot that looks like this one, uh, we have internal heat in here and yield stress on the top. Uh, the numbers that you can find here are different from mine because scaling, uh, slightly different scaling or rheological loads that might be different, but the concepts still stand. So what we observe here, the, we have from stagnant lead to mobile lead, just like uh, uh, classically it's proposed here. But then when we increase the amount of melting, uh, so this is the F is the depletion degree, uh, the lithosphere will become stiff and stiffer and hampers mobility. So all these regimes, they migrate into a stagnant to a sluggish lead, or a mobile lead to something that I've called, we've called the lead and plate, but uh, essentially we'll have a look later on what happens with that. So if we assume that logically the, the yield strength of the lithosphere has not changed in time, so the, the, it's a property of the rocks. So it seems like Byerly already showed that this property of the rock is independent of many other things. So all the uh, plasticity of the rocks, uh, uh, it's around some values that are difficult to explain how they change back in time. So the only thing that we know change in time for sure is the internal heating production of the, of the earth, which has more or less a curve like this one. So if we take this model, 
uh, and we assume that the yield strength hasn't really uh, changed much in time, the only thing that changed is the internal heating. So that would be the path uh, the evolutionary Earth would have in time. So from same uh, yield stress, more or less, uh, but a high internal heating to low internal heating. So if we take the models, we put them all together, uh, by the end of their uh, uh, giga year, so they, they achieve a statistical steady state, but they do not evolve. So we don't change the internal heating uh, in the model so they can achieve some, some uh, stable features. So what happens is that we go from top to bottom with decreasing internal heating. Um, we can see that we have this very rigid, stiff lid produced on the top, but then evol eventually evolves into something that is some blocks where uh, rifting uh, it's viable and then eventually for a lower amount of this very dark pink or light pink blocks that are the depleted portion they disappear they stay some some relics here and there and then eventually the regime is the one that we all know to be the mobile lead that looks like plated tonic so we have uh, ridges here subduction zones there uh, not different from what we already knew so in a way uh, when we compare this with the stabilization inferred of uh, age of stabilization inferred from Crantons from some author, they would say they would have happened around uh, three giga years. Um, of course, Bill Griffin, uh, Condi, and Craig O'Neill, Ken Condi. Uh, when we compare it with our models, we are essentially in an area that the internal heating was um, 2.8, which is the ratio we get from, from this value. So it had to be more than 2, 10 to the minus 11 uh, watts per kilogram. So implying that uh, the regime that I showed you, uh, the transition between a uh, plate mobile lead and uh, a pre um, plate tectonics could have happened easily around uh, three giga years. Another um, observation is essentially this matches quite well uh, with the, the uh, circum records showing that the three giga years onwards something was different and perhaps because the internal heating was higher uh, as I showed you today and eventually takes us to the conclusion number three. At this point, I would say it's also a speculation rather than a conclusion. So the Earth might have been always in a mobile regime, regime mobile lead regime, uh, but then the embedding of a large portion of steep lithosphere might have prevented mobility in the Archean, uh, in essentially freezing the plate margins, uh, but yet allowing episodic occurrences. And this might explain all this evidence of so-called evidence of plate tectonics from the work of Korenaga, so suggested onset time of plate tectonics. Yes, there, there are a number of um, evidence, geological evidences of plate tectonics like, well not plate tectonics, but plate margins activity uh, back to 4.2. Um, which have been taken as an evidence of plate tectonics. In the model I showed you before, we can allow episodic uh, occurrences, but definitely this is not plate tectonics, has been hampered. But then eventually, my speculation is that the decrease in melting in uh, degree and in volume below uh, what would be a logical strength threshold at that point would have allowed finally to uh, evolve this rifting into real ridges and uh, having fully operational uh, uh, subduction zones, ridges, and finally plate tectonics. So the speculation is perhaps that the vanishing of thermomechanical uh, differentiation is, uh, plays a key role for the emergence of plate tectonics. There is a last part which is still in progress in, uh, in my work. Um, it's essentially the role that this thermochemical lithosphere differentiation might have had on the thermal evolution of the Earth. So from classical scaling analysis, it's now classical because it's the work that was done in the 80s by Christensen and Davis. So um, the evolution of the Earth essentially with internal uh, temperature increasing the mantle back in time, reconstructed from the classical scaling of Nusselt number that controls the uh, heat flow uh, by convection and the Rayleigh number which control the vigor of convection, Essentially, we can recover from uh, different modeling uh, approaches and analytical approaches, we can recover a value. But this value, which is an uh, exponent of 0.3, this value is the problem that would increase under a range of Uray ratio proposed by Korenaga here, modeled by Korenaga, would, would inevitably lead to what is called a thermal catastrophe. Meaning that the internal temperature of the mantle would be so large that uh, before two billion years ago, the whole mantle would have been essentially completely melted. And this is obviously against the geological evidence, so it cannot be. And that's why it's been called the paradox, the Archean paradox, or the thermal catastrophe paradox. 
solution has been proposed by June Korenaga, uh, in which she says that uh, the dehydration stiffening, which is a theoretical uh, context for what I implemented in my models, uh, it just finds a scaling that is negative. So what does it mean? It simply means that using the classical scaling for the heat flow and the thickening of the, of the boundary layer, so eventually we can see that in gray, we have a thermal boundary layer that will become thinner and thinner with in, with back in time and increasing temperature, but with uh, compositional stiffening, eventually we get a trend that is inverted. It's the same what we get with the heat flow back with the temperature. They will essentially increase uh, whereas with the thermochemical boundary layer, with internal temperatures as I showed in the model, the boundary layer becomes thicker and the heat flow would decrease. Another way to solve this uh, paradox in Adrian Lenardi publishing the same volume where Korenaga published his own model, he just proposed uh, a thermoregulating process between the heat flow uh, from continents and the heat flow from oceanic basins to buffer temperature and avoid the thermal uh, catastrophe uh, by having simply two areas where the temperature is regulated by the heat flux through the oceanic lithosphere and the other one by continent. So by just using an area of continent versus the total area, uh, Adrian Lenardic was able to prove that uh, the distribution and the growth of continents would have essentially buffered temperatures and avoid uh, this paradox. How this compares to my model? Well, uh, you can simply see here that uh, with increasing uh, internal heat flux and uh, internal temperature that are here for 1300 to 1600, more or less, so around this, this range, the boundary layer does not thin, but instead thickens. So rather than following the thinning process here, it's essentially thickening. So the gray one is essentially the classical boundary layer that you see here. But at a certain point, this is not controlled by the thermal boundary layer uh, scaling here, but it gets the opposite. So the thermochemical boundary layer with these differentiated blocks would follow another trend. It's the same with the heat flux. Uh, so if you can see here in this model by comparing the two, this is low internal heat and this is high internal heating, and they end up with different temperature. So the temperature from uh, present day to past in the mantle increases, which is correct in this way. But if you see the, the heat flow at the end, it's lower for models that have a higher temperature. So essentially stands here. So this model, they follow the same trend. Once we take these trends and we plot them with the models, we can see on the left, the stagnant sluggish lead models only. So those that they have large yield strength and all the models. So if you take each one of these models, every dot is for every 50 million years. And what happens is that this model, they really follow the predicted um, evolution. So for low internal uh, temperatures here, so low internal uh, heating, they're color coded, this model they follow the classical scaling that's been proposed, and that's fantastic. But the models, they have a larger internal heat, so larger uh, temperature, average temperature of the mantle, they develop this thermochemical boundary layer that we indicated here, with the scaling of minus 0.15, beta minus 0.15, and eventually the model, they tend to align. So uh, uh, heat flux is the same, they align at the long term, they align at the long term, and it's the same with this Nassel uh, really number uh, scaling, so where I can derive the, finally, they can test this, this exponent. All the models that do the same, but when we add also those models that are uh, relatively plastically behaving, like the dots, they probably can have a different type of scaling for the uh, boundary layer uh, modeling. And this was already proposed by Christensen. So the beta factor, beta exponent, sorry, can drop to zero. So I'll conclude with the, with the last part, the last um, conclusion, or perhaps if you want another speculation, is that these models here, they reproduce uh, three different type of uh, heat flow exchange. In this range here, for low temperature, we have a thermal boundary layer and everything works beautifully like proposed by scaling analysis. So you can see the heat flux here in red that goes from very high to ridges and uh, follows the classical oceanic profile. So scales with the square root of the age of this oceanic boundary layer and then eventually we reach a subduction zone. On the very other end, we have a thermochemical boundary layer fully fledged as was proposed by Korenaga in which Overall, over the whole surface of the Earth, ideally of this planet, we would have a very low heat flow 
uh, know that the scale here is different. This goes up to 120 uh, milliwatts in, per square meter, and this goes up to 80. So we have an average uh, consistently uh, low um, heat flux on the, above the surface, whereas somewhere in the center, B, I don't have the plot because it's still work in progress, but you can see there are areas that have this characteristic low heat flux that would be around these values here, 40 milliwatts per, per square meter. But also in between, we can form some areas in which the lead is so thin that the heat flux will essentially be very large. So at this point, this is very similar to the idea that Adrian and Arctic has uh, uh, put back in, uh, in 2016, 2006, sorry. Um, more in general, what I propose to you today, it's something that has been speculated already by uh, Moore and Lenardic before me, and perhaps also someone else, in which the classical mantle temperature and heat flux is not the one decreasing from large value of mantle temperature and heat flux down to present day, that would be essentially the green, but instead is uh, follows down with the heat production decreasing and then eventually follows this, this negative slope, which is the thermochemical boundary layer. So this thermochemical differentiation, it's also a way to explain, uh, embed together different um, theories that, that have been proposed to avoid the thermal catastrophe, and they apparently work well together in the models that I showed you today. I'll finally conclude, and the thermochemical industrial differentiation, the condition comparable to the Earth, they show that the dehydration stiffening favors long-lasting rifting, but not ages, the migration then followed by migration and cooling, and finally stabilizing the subcontinental atmospheric mantle in Kratens. Second conclusion is the competition between these two, uh, formation and recycling, may account for the uh, formation and the complete disappearance of the Adean crust. Uh, the other two points are rather speculation, um, and as I showed you, the vanishing of thermochemical differentiation finally could have allowed the transition, the emergence, and the emergence of plate tectonics. And the last one is the one that I just showed you, uh, that perhaps this could be a viable way to avoid uh, the thermal catastrophe, explain the thermal evolution of the planet in a different way. I'll stop it here, and I hope that you're still uh, bearing with me, and uh, I'm happy to take questions if we have time. Yeah, uh, we still, oh, we have time. Uh, okay, very good talk. And now it's time for questions. Uh, so, Chen Ming, uh, are, are you going to ask a question? Yeah, feel free to open your mic. Uh, hey, Fabio, uh, thanks. Gas hey. Uh Thank you so much for the talk. It's very interesting because, uh, um, yeah, I have a bunch of questions. <laughs> in terms of understanding your talk, because uh, mm -hmm. uh, you're a jet dynamicist, I'm a seismologist. So yeah. I try to understand how you actually uh, use all these parameters. So you have this uh, uh, sigma zero, mm -hmm. right? That is, uh, and also you have this internal heating. And yep. then there is the potential temperature of the mantle. So all these different parameters, how do you choose them? And then uh, I see that you explored the parameter space and then you found a set of them that could be very, um, they can depict what's going on or what we observed. Uh, so can you just elaborate a little bit on how, what guides you to choose all this, like for example, the rigidity, or all these other parameters, and plus that's RA, you know, the re really number, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we are, the, the really number in the first place comes naturally from uh, from uh, the um, from the model themselves. So what I showed you about the really number that is higher is essentially the initial condition. So for convection, we just use I just use a, an initial condition which is a statistically um, stable convection. And then eventually it will perturb that. So it's it's a, it's a bit complicated. But the other parameters uh, they follow a little bit uh, the literature, but uh, not strictly because the literature has proposed that you have a generic idea of what would be the internal temperature, which is either the internal temperature or the internal heating, and then eventually you would have a, a plasticity of the of the lithosphere. I don't believe believe all of these are firmly um, constrained. Uh, but there are some caveats there. So the internal temperature of the mantle cannot be simply modeled because it has to be sustained by convection vigor. So the, the, my, my logic is not uh, addressing the internal temperature of the mantle, but the convective vigor of the mantle, and the, the temperature is essentially a consequence. Uh, 
you probably have noticed because I didn't enter the details, but when I show the temperature, I always show the potential temperature and the average temperature. So the average temperature is what I can really measure in my model, but on Earth, we only can measure the potential temperature of the basalts. But the models, they would have two different values. So it, in order to compare it to the observation, we have to somehow broaden up the, the, observ the, the parameters that we propose from the models. For the lithosphere, a classical approach to the lithosphere, lithospheric rigidity would be two. One is the cohesion, and the other one is the frictional slope, so the slope of this bayer lilo To be honest with you, this is purely numerical. <laughs> They, they don't have an equivalent on Earth, meaning that we don't really know exactly on Earth which one of the two parameters would be relevant. To me, the most relevant is the cohesion because the depth dependency is key for the melting. So if you really want this lithosphere that they, they uh, stretch from the bottom, then the depth dependence would be critical. So uh, these are simplified models that are somewhere in between a scaling analysis and a more realistic model. But uh, we, I, I can talk forever about that, but uh, there, there's really, the take home message is much more general on what would be a regime of the earth rather than constraining the values. I see. So it's a, more like a back of envelope kind of calculation. It yes, I it is. Thank you. Of course, I mean, the, the values I use are uh, realistic and quite well constrained, but uh, how, you know, they compare to the Earth, it's, 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 that's the question. I see, yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, more questions from me? Okay, uh, I'm gonna read a question from the audience in the chat box. Yep. And uh, he would like to know if the assumptions in conclusion three could be used to explain the absence of plate tectonics in other planets such as Venus. Absolutely, uh, that's a very smart question. And this is essentially, um, uh, who's this, Tuhin Chakraborty? Yeah, this is essentially something that I'm working on. I haven't presented this today because probably would have been too astray, but Venus is definitely uh, something I'm working on at the moment. In particular, this unzipping of uh, uh, rifting and the production of very large, thick lithosphere, they're very buoyant, produces a gravity signal that is very similar to uh, the Terre the Terre Highlands in Venus. Um, the regime is more or less the same, so uh, the question eventually is whether Venus looks like the Earth. Uh, some authors have proposed that the Venus today looks like the Earth in the Archean, and I would agree with that. Okay. Uh, okay, so, um, so Tuhin was from, uh, is from uh, India Institute of Technology. So next question from Yun Feng Chen, who is at Zhejiang University. Uh, he has a question about lithospheric thickening. So how thick the craton can be during the arcane stiffening process based on your model? Uh, the answer is very, is very simple. It's so simple that I haven't even um, put that in the talk, but as Korenaga um, uh, has done this calculation before me, so in principle, the, the thickening of the lithosphere, the melting of the lithosphere, it's enhanced by, it started by the intersect of the geotherm with the solidus. And for internal temperature they are up to 260 degrees higher than present day, the depth, the intersect is at 260 kilometers. So we can have uh, melting extraction and depletion uh, starting from that depth. Obviously, eventually we are in rifting, so eventually this lithosphere has to cool down, but um, by simply uh, considering that the decreasing of temperature um, decreases in time, so from back to present day, the intersect of the geotherm with the solidus, we can simply uh, recover the decreasing of the thickness of that is observed from Archean to present day. The point is that we, we couldn't explain it somehow. I do believe that Junko Renaga models work perfectly fine, and when I tested this in my models, I can apparently uh, get a better understanding of many, many other processes. I, I cannot explain everything, of course, but uh, I think it, it's really working very well in, uh, in the context of um, devolution. Okay, uh, so next question is from audience LC, and uh, thanks for your nice talk, and uh, I wonder how the Urea ratio would vary with time in your model and how your model predicts the variations of continental crustal thickness. 
Yeah, well, uh, it's, it's not a good question. Uh, uh, I've calculated this in my models. The problem is that it's still work in progress, but indeed the URA ratio would, would, uh, would change. The URA ratio would change. How does it compare to the published models? I still, uh, I still don't know um, because I'm, I'm still working on it. But I have to be honest there, I'm not really sure that this is gonna be a viable answer because my approach, as I was saying before, or was explained before to, to me, this is in a way they are back of the envelope calculation. In another way, they are um, uh, comparable to scaling analysis. The scaling analysis is always done in Cartesian, but the real thermal regime of the earth in Cartesian, it's a bit skewed. So we should have spherical models. So that's the limitation. So I've had some estimates of Uray ratio, but because the thermal regime of my models is not the one of a sphere, I am not really confident that I would have a good understanding. But yes, the, the question is, is really very relevant. It's very relevant and uh, this is also something I looked into, try to answer uh, another big question, but no, I can't. Okay, uh, another question from the audience, Jeff. Uh, thanks you for your talk. I have two questions. And the first, how will the friction coefficient influence the model? Yeah, um, well, uh, that's, that's uh, another important question. And thanks, Jeff, uh, very smart question. Because as I said before, um, there are two approaches there. One uh, group, um, Solomatov, uh, Slava Solomatov, Lewis, Moresi, they would essentially use uh, a frictionless uh, lithosphere. So essentially a vertical uh, strength profile. Um, whereas some other groups, they will consider the, um, the friction, so the, sorry, the, um, yeah, the mu, the coefficient of increase with depth. So um, the friction coefficient influenced the model in the way that it would essentially drop the whole profile. So I've kept the same depth dependence in the strength profile and the cohesion drops down, as opposed to other models that will leave one like that, or otherwise they will leave a cohesion that is constant and will change the, the slope, the mu. So uh, there's not much difference in the regimes because different regimes can be reproduced with different approaches, but there is a very big difference, which is essential in some features, some tectonic features that are produced uh, as opposed to others. For instance, we would not have rifting. So without uh, a depth dependency, we'll have, we will not have rifting in the way that it comes out in my models. Uh, overall, the, the way the friction works is that you drop friction or strength and you go from a stagnant lead to a mobile lead regime. And the second question is, will the mantle continue to melt if it's very depleted with the depletion of depleted rocks? Yeah, exactly, that's another important question. What I haven't done is essentially, um, I haven't uh, accounted for, so my system is closed, meaning that the amount of melt that can be produced is always the same. It, it's, uh, it, we don't go through refractory uh, processes. So my uh, estimates of the total volumes is probably too, uh, way too large, but knowing that, it's also something that I haven't really speculated uh, a lot on. So yes, I agree with you. The other point is, of course, before we answer the question, we have to understand how much of this uh, depleted um, continental atmospheric mantle can be recycled. Because if it can be recycled, then it can be refertilized, and the assumption of a closed system, it's, it's correct. OK, uh, I, think, uh, I think it's one hour shot, so it's perfect. So thank you very much, Fabio, for giving the talk. and. Uh, Thanks for all the audience for participating in and interacting. Okay, with that, I think that's uh, uh, the end of our seminar today. And thank you again, Fabio. Thank you, thank, thank you very much, it was a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, and bye take bye. care of your health. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> no, 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 no. We really appreciate that you gave the talk. Thank you very much. Yep, I hope to see you face to face soon. Yeah, probably in 2022. <laughs> yeah, international traveling will still be very difficult in 2021. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But all the best. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.